And um, the first thing that I'm going to do that I'm going to ask all of you to do is I'm going to ask you to go to the survey monkey link that I just put in and go and take a pretest. Um, if you don't mind, it'll take you 30 seconds. It's only five questions. If you could go and do this pretest and then come back into this and let me know um, that you did that, I would really appreciate it. Um, we're doing pre-tests and post-tests post -tests during this, and we also have a survey at the end. And um, it would just be so helpful for us to know, um, not just for us, but for our funders, how today went, and, um, and the knowledge that was gained today. So if you could go to that and let me know, I would so appreciate it. So all you have to do is just click on the link and it'll take you there. And then we get out of there, we just come right back. This is very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. wait for a few more people to tell me that they're done. Donna, you did not get the email. It's in the, it's right here in the, in the chat here, I'll post it again. So here it is right here. Um, Anahi, I think that's how you say your name. I hope it is. Um, did you, are you raising your hand to let me know if you want to put in the chat that you're done? Um, is, is that what you're trying to tell me? I hope so. That would be amazing. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Did I say your name right? Thank you, everyone who's finishing up. Oh, no. Oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. It's beautiful. Dang it. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Alexis. Oh, shoot, Donna. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure. Um, I'm just, I'm not sure. But thank you for trying. I appreciate it. We'll figure it out. Thank you, Melanie. All right. So I'm going to get started. Um, and the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to ask you a question. So what is or are the nicknames you have for your pets? So if you wanna put this in the chat, that would be great. Um, and we can just look at it. So um, my, I have, um, I have two dogs, two rescue dogs at home. And one of them, his name is Bailey, but I never call him Bailey. I call him Schnoots because he's a schnoodle. He's half schnauzer, half poodle. And so I call him Schnoots and that's my nickname for him. He's my schnooty newt. Mush, I love it. Um, copper and mini copper, Carly boy, that's cute. Her name is Luna, but she goes like Lucifer or uh, Lunifer. That's cute. Miss V Sushi. Yeah. So my second dog, I rescued her in January. She is half pit bull, half lab. She's a black beauty. Um, but I call her Dragon because um she is. That's what she reminds me of, just like this dragon, but like a timid dragon that would never hurt anyone. <laughs> and I also call her the um, the most beautiful lady in the land. So that's what I like to call her, my most beautiful lady in the land. So Max or Mad Max be on the Thunderdome. Yes, Jennifer. Yes, I love that. Oh, Sunday, Coco, Cocolita. I love it. Slim because his name is oh Simba and that's so cute. My phone is ringing. Why? 
I don't know. Oh, Simba, that's a cute name. That is a cute name. I like that. That's my Disney lifestyle right there. I'm here for it. Thank you all so much. Oh my gosh, is it is it National Dog Day? Shut up. When we're doing this, I feel so good about life right now. Oh my gosh, thank you for posting that because that is amazing and I'm feeling good. Um, Kimberly, totally fine. I'm so happy to see you here, Kimberly. Um, let's talk about pet safety. All right. So thank you all for sharing that. I just like to start it off with a little cuteness for the morning. Um, so our objectives today are what does advocacy look like for survivors and pets? How does a program get started? Does discuss liability concerns and how can pets, how can we help survivors now? So this is only going to be about an hour. We've done, this is the third in a series, um, but I see a lot of new people here today. So that's really amazing because this is obviously like where here, like where we want to get to here in Arizona. So I'm glad you're all here. Um, I, you know, we're trying to make it as comprehensive as possible. If anyone has anything that they want to, um, uh, thank you so much, Donna. The Humane Society puts on, puts on, a, on, on a calendar. That is amazing. I'm so excited about life right now. Um, so if anyone has any comments or, or, or anything that they want to contribute, please put that in the chat and we'll discuss it. Like I, I, I really would love for this to be kind of an open discussion a little bit once we get into like who we can per, who we can think about like start, I, I just want to suggest a start thinking about who in our community can we start um, uh, talking to about co-sheltering or even bringing awareness to your community um, if they don't already know like who's in that community that we can talk to and have um, more comprehensive conversations with and like um, because I think that this is a really good issue. Um, it's a terrible issue. We wish we didn't have this issue, um, but it's a good issue to bring to the community because people love their pets. Look at all those nicknames we just looked at. Um, and not every community, not every culture, you know, believes that hanging animals are here for us, but a large part of the um, of our communities actually do believe that companion animals are um really important and we call them our fur babies we we love them um sometimes people have animals instead of children that's okay i support it um sometimes you have children and pets and sometimes your pets outweigh your children at some point sometimes when you have teenagers that might be just in my house because i have a teenager and sometimes my dog is my comfort <laughs> so um you know, so uh, it just like we just start thinking about as we continue on who in your community could you work with and it doesn't need to be just veterinarians and and pet rescues, but who else. So I just um, just a little forward thinking as we continue on. So violence, even non physical violence can be very disturbing for animals. They feel it in their body and can develop lots of reactions to it, including fear responses, hiding, depression, and anxiety, especially if they have been housed somewhere temporarily as a result of domestic violence. So we, I put this in here because I thought it was really important for us to make sure that we start this off talking about that it is, and so last, last week we talked about trauma for survivors and, and pets. And, and this kind of jumps us off again, thinking about that violence, even non-physical violence, really does affect our pets, just like it does our survivors, right? We know that non-violence, that non-physical violence is, is real. We know that physical violence, it does not encapsulate everything that happens in domestic violence for our survivors. And that goes along with our animals as well that are living inside the home with us and they can feel it. And one of the things that, that happens is that perpetrators or abusers and our, our abusive partners don't think, a lot of times they don't think that animals are sentient beings, which means that they have no feelings. And so they don't realize the effect that they're having on, on the animals that are inside the home along with, um, along with the, the survivor themselves. And so Donna just wrote, I had a gentleman call in crisis. He had a cat 
he needed to be hospitalized but would not go because he did not have anyone to care for his cat. I later found out he had to give his cat away. He cried when he told me my heart was broke. Donna, like, thank you so much for sharing this story. This is why we're here today so that we can build more resources in our community. That's what we want, right? We wanna build more resources in our community. And I said this the last two weeks, we are already taking in, like we are already supposed to be taking in um, the, the survivors that have um, animals that are like the service animals. We already are supposed to be doing that. They have to come into our shelter. We have to allow that. Is it so much of a pivot for us to allow survivors with companion animals that are gonna help in their healing journey that have saved them? Is it, is it too much? Can we do it? Is it too hard to pivot um, to letting animals come into our, to co-shelter with us at, at shelter or in our programs? Because it, it just, it shouldn't be that much of a pivot. And there are a lot of resources out there to help us with these things. And, and ACES DV is one of those. And so that's why we're here today. Um, and so I just want to, to us to think about that. Like, is it so far of a stretch for us to think that, okay, we're already taking in service animals. Is it too much for us to add in companion animals, especially to help on the healing journey? journey. There are survivors that we are talking to right now that refuse to, that refuse to be away from their animal, refuse to be away from their pet because their pet is the thing that's keeping them going. It's keeping them strong. It's keeping them coming to support groups. It's keeping them, you know, sane. It's keeping them, you know, with love in their hearts and stuff and, 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 and keeping them where, you know, in a safe place. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're here for those survivors that, that refuse to go anywhere without their pet. They're willing to stay in the relationships or live on the street so that they can make sure that their pet is taken care of and stays with them. We don't want to see that, right? We don't want to see survivors having to choose between living on the street or living with their, 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 their perpetrator when, they're, when they want to leave. They don't always want to leave, but if they want to leave and they want to find you know, safety in another space, do we want to make them choose? So just some, some stuff to think about. So historically, cruelty to animals has been viewed as an issue separate from other forms of violence and ignored by the human services and criminal justice fields. Separate systems are involved. Um, there's been a patchwork of statutes leads to a lack of uniformity enforcement. So even though on ARS 1336.01, which is our domestic violence state statute here in Arizona, there is a, an animal um, cruelty law a lot of law enforcement doesn't look like from what I've learned and what I've gathered, they don't, they, they will take that, that animal and they will call animal control and all of this stuff will happen or they'll come out to a scene where the animal has died and no other investigation will continue. Even though there is such a large percentage of animal cruelty and domestic violence that go hand in hand, um, domestic violence, child abuse, and elder abuse, um, that it's like, it, we're just so siloed and we think that one sometimes doesn't have anything to do with the other. So this is why we need to bring awareness as to why this is all coming together, like why we're talking about this. So confidentiality constraints preclude sharing information among agencies. Um, you know, if there's that ROI in place, um, I don't see if there, there's that, that, um, that form that's in place. I don't see why we couldn't have some more sharing information when it comes to animal cruelty. And then animal cruelty cases are notoriously difficult, costly, and time consuming. Animal law has only recently become a specialized discipline and attorneys have had little training in it. So for those of us that live in Maricopa County, um, there are like Maricopa County um, Prosecutor's Office, um, they they actually do a lot of work around animal animal cruelty. They have an animal cruelty unit, and they do um, they do 
uh, presentations for law enforcement. It's been a while since they've had one though, because I think that their lead, their lead um, prosecutor, I think she is a judge now in Gilbert. I'm not sure. I think that's what I heard. But um, this is something that is going on. And I know that um, just a few months ago, the, the Humane Society, like the American Humane Society, not just Arizona, but the American Humane Society did regional trainings for law enforcement and for prosecutors and attorneys. Um, I was able to go to the one in Pima County. And so they did a one day training with, um, with folks and they had someone from animal control there and it's very fascinating. So there is, more and more conversations about the link between violence and animal cruelty and what people need to have, be on the lookout for. So we're coming together here in Arizona. We're doing a lot of work around this and it's very exciting, but we still need to make sure that we're building a network to make sure that we're building safety around these families that we're working with. Sometimes my mouse just doesn't like to work and I apologize. So rather than compartmentalizing services, a collaborative interagency approach is more effective when addressing victims experiencing overlap, overlapping forms of maltreatment. So again, we need to be collaborating. I, all, I, for those of you that have been to any sort of training with me or Doreen or anyone from the coalition, we heavily believe in collaboration, community collaboration and having conversations um, you know, at your CCRT meetings or your SART meetings or your MDTs or whatever, if there's an element of, of animal cruelty that is involved. And these things should be asked when investigated. Um, when you're in your fatality review, like there should be a question, like a question about pets come up. Um, did they have any pets? Did anyone know? Like, and, and, and having those things come up in those meetings so that we can build so that we can have more awareness that this that that there is a link between violence and and animal cruelty so recognize that survivors strong emotional attachments to pets can be used as a weapon by batterers and we want to add um, we suggest adding um, three questions about pets to a crisis line to intake interviews and risk assessments um, are there any pets in the home? How does each family member treat the pet? And do you worry about something bad happening to the pet? People are more likely to talk about pets than they are about the own, their own abuse or the abuse that's happening with their children. They're more likely to talk, to answer these three questions um, or any questions about pets. And so I wish Sarah was on here, Sarah Youngblood from CLS. They've added to their intake form at, um, uh, community legal services, they added a pet question. Um, and so it's really important. And also um, Safe DBS has added a pet question to when they're talking to survivors calling in for Maricopa County, which is amazing. And so um, adding a pet question into intakes and risk assessments and, and your interviews and, and is really important. And people want to be asked. Um, there was a study that was done, um, I'll try to find it for you all and send it out, that says that 11% of the women that were coming into shelter wanted to be asked about, their, asked about their pets and never were asked about them. And so that's something like people want to be asked about their pet. They want to know that they're safe. They want to know, like, they want to talk about it. Clearly, they want someone to listen to them. And so that's really important because again, like that's part of healing someone wholly. Like just asking about pets is the same about asking about safety planning. It's the same about asking about intimate partner sexual violence. We need to be asking these questions um, to make sure that people can heal because if we leave these questions out, if they had a pet at home that no one's ever asked them about or listened to their story or talked to them about it or tried to find resources, then they're missing a whole piece on their healing journey. And that's what, not what we want, right? Like we want to heal people fully. Um, and, that's, and, and, and we want to find safety for them as a whole person and their pet might be included in that. So this is from one of our survivors um, from our share committee. I went to several domestic violence resources for help leaving and was told by all of them that they could get me out and get me to safety and into shelters, housing, et cetera, as soon as I figured out how to get rid of my dog. 
As long as I had my dog with me, they couldn't help me. One of them in particular suggested that I surrender him to the animal shelter and then come back. So this was not something that the survivor was willing to do. And this is something that we really need to listen to survivors about. And if there's any way that we can help them, we really need to work and find a way. And we've got some, some strategies later on that we'll talk about. This was also from that committee. Now there are seven, there are actually nine responses now after I already put this together. But it just goes to show you um, that even with eight responses um, from, from, or seven responses, but there were eight people, now nine people that filled out this, um, this survey for us, 85% did not have resources for their pets. Um, and, and as you can see from the quote before, like that's devastating, devastating. So pets, um, a child's cruelty is it, is, so talking about pets can be a predictor. So a child's cruelty to animals may be an indicator that the child has suffered serious neglect or abuse and may lead to an increased likelihood of their violent behaviors in childhood and adulthood. Not all children who hurt animals become violent adults and not all adult animal abusers hurt their partners or children. The reason why this is in here, because I talked about this in previous uh, uh, webinar, the reason why this is in here now is just so that um, staff and and you know uh, programs and shelter workers and just people working with the public and their pets that you can all be aware that this might be something that comes up in shelter and so that you can have resources to help that child, um, whatever that may be. Because if you, especially if you do start um, having co-sheltering and something happens. I just wanted to put this on your radar that it's a predictor of animal cruelty later on in life. About 43% of the um, school shootings that have happened, there's been a history of animal, of animal abuse starting from Columbine and working its way through um, till now. And so that's a huge percentage. But like, I, but like it says here, not all children who hurt animals become violent adults. But still, it is something that we need to have on our radar so that we have the resources to help those children as they come into shelter with us or with their survivor. And neighbors who are traditionally reluctant to get involved in domestic violence or child abuse cases may be moved to file an animal cruelty report. Um, so right now, like during COVID, it's been pretty quiet for DCS on the child abuse cases. Um, I, as we've been doing, um, for those of you that were here last week, you heard me say that we've been doing work, we do work with child, with, um, child welfare and they've just kind of been like all the new advocate or all the new caseworkers have just kind of had this relaxing summer. And I told them last week that like all hell's about to break loose for them. Um, because you know, a lot of the calls that they get on the hotline for child abuse are, um, are from teachers or school administrators, but during COVID, there's been a little bit of an uptick around across the country for neighbors calling on animal abuse. Um, so, and, and having, and those people sometimes are first responders to other things that are happening inside the home. So animal control, law enforcement, things like that. So it's been pretty interesting this year to see the changes. So animal cruelty laws in Arizona. Um, so a person commits cruelty to animals if he or she intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly subjects any animal under the person's custody or control to, to cruel neglect or an abandonment, fails to provide medical attention necessary to prevent protracted suffering to any animal under the person's custody or control, inflicts unnecessary physical injury to any animal or recklessly subjects any animal to cruel mistreatment, among other things. Animal is defined as a mammal, bird, reptile, or amphibian. So I thought it was really, really important that we talk about that, that we just have a reference for the animal cruelty laws in Arizona. Um, and I forgot to tell you this, but if anyone wants a copy of this presentation, you're more than welcome to email me after we're done and I will send it out to you in a PDF form so that you have all this information. Um, so this is just one of our laws here in Arizona. Um, so, and then, Pets are, you, we can put them under an order of protection. So the 2010 Arizona amendments provided that if a court issues an order of protection, the court may grant the petitioner exclusive care, custody, or control of any animal that is owned, possessed, leased, kept, or held by the petitioner. 
the respondent or a minor child residing in the residence or household of the petitioner or the respondent and order the respondent to stay away from the animal and forbid the respondent from taking, transferring, encumbering, concealing, committing an act of cruelty or neglect in violation of section 13-2910 or otherwise disposing of the animal. So basically this helps keep, um, uh, helps keep that that survivor um, especially if they have um, the the um, protection where they're inside the home so civil standby orders are made in domestic violence cases where a no contact order has been imposed and the result is to prevent the defendant from returning to his or her home the civil standby order provides one-time access to the household under under the supervision of law enforcement for the purpose of retrieving a limited number of belongings of personal effects. That does not include the animal if this order, if the judge has granted this order. And reporting in Arizona, so mandatory reporting. We are not mandatory reporters, but veterinarians are. Um, as far as animal cruelty goes, we are mandatory reporters for child abuse and um, and um, and adults, but not for um, for not for animal abuse. So, a veterinarian who responsibly suspects, responsibly or reasonably suspects or believes that an animal has been a victim of abuse, cruelty, or neglect, or has been involved in an animal fighting, has been involved in animal fighting, shall report that suspicion or cause a report to be made to law enforcement within 48 hours after treatment or examination. A veterinarian who files a report has as provided in this section um, shall be immune for civil liability with respect to any report made in good faith. So I thought that was really in, in, important um, just so that like as we go out into the community we can let veterinarians know that they that this is something like if they suspect this like um, you know they can as we're making those connections out in the community it's really important for us to educate veterinarians because they may not know this or they may not do anything about it. Whereas like we're, we can help them understand why it's so important and then it can lead to other things between that link between violence and domestic violence or violence and pet abuse, I apologize. So where do we start? So um, we can, so when we're talking about co-sheltering, um, we can start small. First, does anyone have any questions so far? I didn't ask that. So I just wanted to check as we pivot a little bit. All right, no questions. Awesome. So we're gonna start small when we're talking about co-sheltering. No one's asking everyone to build a huge facility at their location. Um, that would not be that would not be responsible of me to do that. Um, but we can have conversations and start small. Um, whatever the capacity is that you can do, um, we can start with that. And so the first thing we want to do is, we, you know, ask about animal welfare, welfare on hotlines and intakes. Um, that's easy. We can start with that. Just having a couple of those questions about animals in your program is going to just change the game. Um, people are going to feel like they're being heard. Survivors are going to feel like they might be a little bit safer because you're asking about these things because eventually we're going to have a plan in place. So if a, if a survivor comes to us, we're either going to have a foster program in place, we're either going to have we're going to have some sort of resource for them. The second thing that we can do um, to start off small um, without building a huge facility is we can start safety planning. So having a conversation about pets um, when we're safety planning is really important, especially if someone has already told us during intakes that they do have an animal. Um, and what that means. So safety planning, um, you know, making sure that they have, if they're leaving that, if you're a mobile advocate or if you're talking to someone and they plan on leaving, making sure that they have all the documents that they need and um, all of the, the food, like some food that they can bring with them um, and leashes, toys, bones, whatever that animal may need so that we can make sure that they are, um, that, that, that the animal can come with them safely, as well as, you know, you may want to have a conversation, like if they're a chipped animal, if the animal's been chipped, do we need to call the chip company and change the address to something safer? Um, that might be something because perpetrators could, um, 
definitely call that and, and see what, and, you know, having conversation with the people on the other end of the line might be something that needs to happen to let them know that, that for safety reasons, you don't want this information to be told about the new address. Um, so that they can put that in their notes. Um, safety planning if they're um, if they're in shelter and if they need to go back and get and retrieve their animal um, what does that safety plan looks like look like if they can't if they left their animal but they have space or a resource for their animal now um, how do they go back in and get that get that animal from their perpetrator if that animal had to stay um, so what are those type of things look like and then maybe we just start off with cats. Maybe you start off with just a space for cats. Cats are easy. Cats, you know, they don't take up a lot of room. They don't bark. Um, you know, is there room for that? Is there space for that in, in, um, in your shelter or small dogs that can be housed within the room um, with other families? Guinea pigs, turtles, birds, fish, what does that mean? Do we just start off with one of these things, let someone with a turtle come in that has their own habitat for them, snakes? I don't know how you all feel about snakes, but um, do, we let, do we let survivors come in with these smaller animals um, just to get us started um, so that we can kind of feel it out, see what happens, see how staff reacts, those type of things. Um, start with one or two rooms that have been pet proofed. Um, so uh, there's literature and, and there's a great resource from Greater Good Arizona um, that, will, that I put on here on this presentation that you can call them. Um, Bryn, she's amazing. You can call her, you can call Greater Good and you can talk to them about what it would take to pet proof, um, what that means. There's a lot of research about pet proofing rooms so that, you know, when, when folks are moving out, folks can move in, but maybe you save one or two rooms right now for folks that just have animals and that's like the room with animals. And maybe that's the start and maybe, maybe you go from there, but at least having one safe space. And then start with one kennel, start with one kennel that you can put, put there. And so really interesting something that's come up lately and um one of the sh one of the programs here in arizona called us um about funding for to get a couple kennels to keep animals in because they're part of a, a foster care um program they have a partnership with a foster with with folks in their community that help foster animals while while survivors are living in shelter and so um which is great it's another route you can go but um so they needed kennels to um to house the animals until that that foster family could come in and get the animals or so that the animals could be transferred out into that foster family so that's a really great way to use that and you can even keep have kennels and keep the kennel and give the kennel to the foster family that will then give the kennel to that survivor when they when they're able to go into transitional housing or whatever their next steps are in their healing journey. Um, maybe that's something that you look at. And then assess your staff. It's really important. Some staff members are not going to be on board for this, um, but it's important to have conversations, to, have, to talk to your staff. Don't just say, okay, one day we're just gonna, now we have a huge dog here. Um, and stuff. So having conversations with your staff, feeling them out, see how they feel about it. Some may be really excited. Some may, be, may just need more education about what this means and what it's going to look like. And just these are these are just some things to think about before taking like bigger steps. And then we want to assess the community. So we want to garner support. And this comes from a, a model called. Um, called the safety, safety Program, and I have their resource at the end, but they have an entire, um, this was made by a woman, her name is Allie Phillips, and she um, does a lot of work, like legislatively and with communities um, around safety and, and pets and building um, co-sheltering models inside uh, uh, domestic violence and homeless programs. And so, this this kind of comes from her assessing the community in her um i watched a presentation with her and she said that in um that we can't do this alone like i talked about before those siloing 
um, organizations that we've been siloed doing animal cruelty work for such a long time and we're now just branching out and, and bringing awareness to our communities but garnering support from community partners because we can't do this alone. It can't just be one staff member that's doing this. Um, so we need to get our executive directors on board, our board members on board, community partners that, that you feel like might really get involved with this because they're going to help fund it, right? If you can get community partners involved, they're going to help you with fundraising needs and they're going to think really outside the box for that, um, for those fundraising needs um, as they come up. And then your animal protection community, so pet rescues in your community, um, and then your veterinary community. And we'll kind of talk about all of those things because for some, for certain funding to get started, um, you have to have a relationship with your pet protection and veterinary community. And so we'll talk about that. But we'll be thinking about community partners and like, let's discuss that later, what that means, who those people are, what community partners can we partner with? Because um, that's really important to start thinking about those things now and garnering that support, not just funding support, but just support in your community, because they're going to bring awareness, not just to your organization, but to domestic violence and to also um, pet violence. So because people love their pets, right? We've talked about this. We want to educate staff as we make these changes because we don't, again, we don't want to just throw people into the, in, into it um, without assessing what their needs are and, and helping them get educated. So have a pet advocate or a social worker on staff that is really versed in, um, in these type of things, um, in talking about um, pet welfare and even a pet behaviorist, if you're able to have that. Um, and you might, with partnering with some of those community members, a veterinarian's office, or um, or your local pet rescue, they might have an, uh, someone that can become a pet advocate for you, um, and that can come and t and do um, and help help to educate the staff and do teaching moments with them. And you guys can have some really diverse conversations about trauma informed care when it comes to survivors and to and to their pets. So what to do if there is an aggressive, excited, or passive animal that comes in? So what do we do about that? How do we figure that out? Um, why is the animal um, aggressive, excited, or passive? And then animals just have different personalities. Not every animal deals with the tr their trauma, just like humans, right? You know, we don't all deal with trauma the exact same. And what someone's traumatic, what might be something traumatic for someone, might not be as traumatic as for someone else. And so we all deal with it differently. Animals also have personalities that helps them, that helps them deal with their trauma. And so that might look like that aggressiveness or it could look excited or it could look passive. Um, I have, I told you both of my dogs are rescues. I have one who just licks. He just licks everything. He licks me, he licks my kid, he licks our couch. He just, he just licks the air. Um, and that's one of his coping mechanisms for whatever happened to him before he came to me, um, his coping mechanism. I mean, he could just be a licking dog. I don't know, but he licks when he wants to feel safe and he does it all the time and stuff. So it just, it, like, that's what he does to, to self-soothe is he licks. Animals and culture. Um, so let, having conversations about animals and culture and that not every culture is down to, to have companion animals and, and, and here for animals inside the home or inside the shelter or the program. Um, and what does that look like? Do those people even need to be involved um, at that point? Um, but, but at the same time, recognizing and having some education around that, like this is, a re this is just one more resource for folks because they don't want to leave their animals with their perpetrators or they don't want to choose between um, having, a safe, having a safe space and having a, a space that is not as safe. And then educating on DV, trauma, and pets and, and, and maybe thinking about having a, either a pet behaviorist on staff or someone that you've contracted with um, through the connections that you've made in your community. So um, this was really, this was interesting for me that I found um, it could be something that is printed out and put up. 
All right. So Jenna um, says for Maricopa people, please reach out if you want to collaborate with AZ Humane. Thank you so much, Jenna. She's come to all three of these and it's been great. So um, yes, please reach out if you have anything you want to talk about with her. Um, she's working on some ideas to bring more awareness to our communities, um, to her community, and hopefully we can do some, some really good work with, with AZ Humane. Thank you so much, Jenna, um, for attending today and all three weeks. I appreciate it. But this is the canine ladder of aggression. Um, so this is something that you can print out and put up just so that people um, and, and kind of start having conversations with their staff around it. So the gestures shown on the lower rungs of the ladder, such as yawning, putting ears back and raising a paw, meaning I'm feeling worried, don't threaten me, please calm down. Um, and then those on the higher rungs of the ladder, such as growling, snapping and biting means stop, leave me alone right now. Understanding the meaning of these gestures and encouraging your staff to be more aware of them will help avoid the last resort of aggression. So, sometimes this happens with survivors, right? Like, survivors don't always come into our programs completely, like every survivor is different, how they deal with what's happened to them, right? Some are fired up, they're angry, they, they, want, they want this, that, and the other, and some are more, more complacent, right? Like they're just, like that's just how they come in and some are just you never know that they were a survivor at all right because survivors can be anyone like a victim can be anyone of domestic violence and the same goes for our animals like they might like we don't know what happened to them in that home hopefully through having conversations with that survivor we learn a little bit more and we help them um, become a leader with their animal um, for, to, you know, because animals need to be, they need a leader of the pack, they need someone to look up to, they need calm, they need, um, uh, they need stability in their lives and stuff. And so working with them um, to, to kind of, you know, recognize those things and then also working with our staff to recognize what these things actually mean um, and that we need to, you know, and not to continue forward if a dog is saying, stop, leave me alone right now. Um, with the growling, snapping, or biting. And so we need to just make sure that we're, it's just all about communication as, as, we, as we open up our doors to, to bring in animals. Um, communication with staff and the survivors living in, in shelter or the program that we're working with and um, the community at large. So some liability concerns. So there are concerns about biting and concerns about destruction, allergies, if they leave their animal behind. All of these are really good concerns. Um, we're gonna touch on some of them uh, right now. Um, so I have, so the next slide is mitigating, but I just wanted to, to make sure that if, if there's any more that you can think of, like let's talk about them, or I can look some, I can talk to some of my resources and look some of that stuff up. Um, but mitigating some of these things that, that this is what I've, from talking to folks across the country that are doing this work, these are some of the things that we've come up that, that have helped with those liability concerns. So having a policy where people stay 10 feet away from that animal um, and that survivor, like if they're out for a walk or if they're coming to the door or anything. Screen for ag aggressive animals, not to screen them out, but again, but for awareness, same for health issues, not to screen the animals out, but just so that people are aware so that we can have conversations with the folks that are doing the work with survivors with their animals because that might be something that you do. Maybe you have a point person or two point people, two point advocates that, that are here for it. They're excited. They want to work with the survivors coming in with their animals. And so having conversations with them about like what to look out for, like what does that aggressive, what does that aggression look like for your animal? Um, and then the health issues, what does that look like? Can we get veterinary care for them? Um, do we have the resources to do that? And then dog's body language to educate staff, like we just looked at. No pets in a, share, in a shared unit, if that's at all possible, depending on if they can be kenneled, um, what kind of animal it is, what that looks like, if it's a larger dog or two large dogs, maybe that's something that you think about. Um, if possible, a designated staff member to meet the pet and parent, just to go over what the expectations are, um, we don't want to put a lot of barriers on people. Obviously, we like the no, no to low barrier model um, for shelter and housing, but that, but just talking to them about what is to be expected 
when they come into shelter with their pet? What does that look like? Do you have a model where someone else is taking care of the pet or are they in the same room with their survivor? What does that look like? Ask, ask survivors about pets personality and communicate that with staff. No pets in a community space, no lingering. So no, no just loitering around, no lingering. Um, intakes, so making sure that we're talking about these, thing in, these things at intake and letting other residents know that co-sheltering is on campus. So we don't want to, we don't want to have a new survivor come in and not let them know that this is happening, um, that, 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 so that they're not surprised the next morning when they wake up and they see someone out walking their animal. Um, we just want to make sure that we're as transparent as possible. So liability forms. My goal in life is to have a liability form made for the Arizona DV standards that's just in there so that folks can use it. We love our standards. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. And so that's my goal right now. I'm having a little bit of trouble because some, some organizations have to get permission from their, um, their board or their executive director or their HR to let me see their liability forms. So I'm working with them right now to get that done. Um, if anyone has one from their organization that they wanna share or you have ideas, please send it to me. Because I'm not gonna just steal from people, but it is to give us a good idea um, about what that could look like, and then um, and then hopefully building one and putting it into our Arizona DB standards, so that all the organizations who want to start doing this and have a, and want to have a liability form can take that form and make it their own for their own own organization. But I think it's important for us to have like a general form for this. It just normalizes that animals are part of um, of our community and a part of our survivors lives if we have some sort of liability form that is a general form that we can use and then and then folks can take into their program and use that so if you have any ideas or you want to work on this with me please let me know i'm more than happy to collaborate so i was able to talk to angelina mccaster from lost our home lost our home is an organization um uh, that partners with, it's a pet rescue that has partnered with Sojourner Center, who has the only um, pet um, shelter in Maricopa County at this time. They're not the only ones working with pets, um, but they have an actual shelter that's built onto their campus. And so their, um, their pet behaviors from Lost Our Home, um, we had a great conversation and I wanted to put in some of the things that she talked about. So this is what she sees. So 95% taking time to get it, of her job is taking time to get to know the pets. So that's the majority of her job. So you get to know these pets, get to know what makes them tick, get to know their aggressions, get to know um, why they lick all the time or whatever, whatever their self, self soothing is. Um, they do behavior evaluations. Um, she said all dogs, pets in the beginning are learning new boundaries, right? Just like children. This is children when they come into shelter, right? Um, uh, so it's just, they're learning new boundaries, where they can go, what they can do, who's a friend, who's a foe, um, those types of things. It's a new place and they're shut down and they might not communicate. They may just hide under the bed or hide in a corner and they may not um, engage with any staff members um, or, or even their survivor at that time, just because it's new and there's a lot of, like I said, animals really thrive on stability. Um, they need to learn new social skills. They need to learn social skills to communicate how they are feeling, especially if they haven't been able to learn anything before because of the violence that might have been in the relationship with their pet parents. And then each animal and pet is different, just like every survivor is different, each animal or pet is as well. Um, uh, they might have stopped communicating in the way that they did before. And so that's something that even their survivor, like we need to reteach those things and walk with our survivors and having conversations about, about what that looks like for community. They might not communicate the same way they did before because this is a new environment and they're still getting used to it. And they might need to just breathe a little bit because they're in a safer environment. Um, right? Just like that survivor might need that breathing space. 
and teaching them that they are allowed to communicate. So helping the survivor to, so what she does is she helps that survivor and that pet be able to communicate with each other again and relearn how to do that with each other. If there's been some sort of bond that's been broken between the two um, and that they're allowed to communicate, not just with their survivor, but with those around them. And then getting them comfortable in the presence of a new human. So her, her being the new human um, or any sort of staff that might be involved with that pet, um, that pet and their survivor. And then play groups. Play groups might be a really good idea. She really enjoy, she really says that play groups are, um, are something that is helpful so that animals can learn because animals learn by looking at other animals, just like as humans do. We learn how to act and behave when we are social and animals are the same way. Remember, like, especially for dogs, like, like dogs are pack animals. So they really need that play group time. Cats, maybe not so much. Cats are just in their own realm, all on their own, and they're awesome. Um, but just making sure that they have the space that they need so that they can, so that they can start healing too. Um, and some of this stuff that she talks about, and even on the next slide, goes against some of those liability issues. And so what I wanted to say about that is that, you know, if you're having people stay 10 feet away, and maybe we do that for the first month or the first 30 days, and then we have a reevaluation with that survivor to um, really see where that pet is at, if, if, especially if they are, are having health issues or if they were a little bit more aggressive as they came in. I will tell you with most of the folks that I talk to um, across the country um, that are doing this work, they, um, they've had almost no aggressive issues. Um, and, and some of that is just because of their own liability and some of that is just that some of that aggression goes away as that animal starts to feel safe. And so biting and stuff has been, it's been once or twice or not at all since they've had their pet program across the country. Um, and that just goes to show just like, you know, and, and most of them started off really small. Like we talked about, a lot of them started off with just cats or small dogs in the beginning um, before, they, before they really started to build their program. Um, but it's important for us to, um, to think about some of these things in the beginning. So management of safety measures, limitations, making canvas too restricted. This is also from Angelina um, from Lost Our Home. One of the things that she sees is that it can be like the animals are just too restricted and, and that makes the survivor be restricted as well. And so we want, especially for those survivors that have been isolated, right? Like we want them to start communicating and learn how to communicate with folks that are inside shelter as much as they can so that they can relearn those communication skills so that when they're, when they're ready to leave, when they go into transitional housing or whatever, wherever their, their pack leads, that they get, that they have some of those skills to like feel safe and secure out in the world. Um, and, 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 and continue on their healing path, we want their animals to feel the same way. So even, so that's what I was saying is that like, if you're going to have like, everyone stays away for 10 feet, maybe we reevaluate that, um, those, those limitations and those mitigating uh, liabilities in 30 days or 60 days and see like how that transition looks and what can we do to make sure that, that both the survivor um, and that pet are being socialized so that they feel comfortable enough to leave when their time is done at shelter or in their program. Survivors lack confidence to go out into the world. And so a lot of times when this happens, they'll surrender their animal to the shelter that they're in or they'll go to a pet rescue because they just don't feel confident enough to take care of themselves and to take care of their pet anymore. And that is something we don't want to have happen, right? We don't want, they, they, they are so strong and they got to us for a reason with their animal. We, we, you know, we're a resource. They got to us. How did you get here? Like you're like, they're so brave and strong and they're amazing people and so resilient and nimble and amazing. And it's, it's, she said, she told me that it's tough to see them, them surrender their pet at the end of their time in shelter because they just don't feel the confidence because they were so restricted from having conversations because they had their pet with them. 
um, while they were there. And so they had to surrender that pet because they just didn't feel confident enough to take care of themselves and their pet that time. So other animals can help with roadblocks and healing. Again, assessing that, like having play groups and having conversations and letting other animals see other animals being walked on a leash or going up and being petted by a human or a stranger or whatever. And what does that look like? And, and those other animals can learn those things. Can help with housing. So, um, so having, so this, so making sure, so we know that housing is a really big deal. We know that it's really hard to get into. Landlords may want to see that their animals, that the, and that the survivor's animal as they're going into an apartment or housing or anything is a good animal if they're allowed to. Like we've paid the pet deposit, we're here to go. That landlord might want to know that this animal is good with other humans, that they don't have to worry about liability or risk. And so we really want to make sure that, that pet is ready to go and has the social skills to be able to um, to be able to communicate those things to, to a landlord. Um, so it could help with housing to be able to um, be able to have socialization skills there. So getting ready to get self self sufficient. It affects social development skills. And then the world gets bigger when transitioning from shelter to housing. And so just not just for our survivor, but also for their pet, the world just gets a lot bigger. Um, you know, safe space for four months or however long. And now we're able to go to, to move about differently and go out into the world and have more conversations. And so being able to have a safe place and maybe you do play groups you know, maybe you start up a play group. Maybe if you have the staff members that you um, that you that want to really do this work and be a pet advocate inside your your shelter or your your program, they that's what they do. They start a play group for the folks that have pets that want to socialize their pets and want to socialize with each other. You know, us pet parents, we want to talk about our pets all day long, right? Like we want to look at pictures, we want to see everything. Show me your dog. How cute is this? Like we want to be able to have those conversations um, and it will bring connection. It will bring community and connection is healing. Connection is healing, especially for those that have been isolated with their partner. Um, we want to build those connections within our programs. And this is just one way of doing it is connecting through their pets. And then moving real life scenarios. So, so what this means is just what she said is that, um, you know, having the animals see real life scenarios, having the animals be able to go and watch the kids play on the playground and know that that's okay. Or watching folks drinking coffee at like, you know, in the quad or wherever, whatever space is available um, where people gather and, and there's normal reactions. Seeing someone pet another dog, seeing a dog being walked, seeing children run around. Um, what are the, like seeing those real life scenarios so that when they do go out into the, in, into the world that, that has gotten bigger for them out of shelter into housing, that they are comfortable enough with those scenes that they're not going to react excitedly or in a, in an, or in an aggressive manner. And so, so making sure that our pets and our pet parents are seeing these real life scenarios play out and know that those things are completely normal and are supported in our program. So money to get started. Um, so a lot of you have probably heard me talk about Red Rover if you've t ever heard me talk to you before about this. Um, so I'm actually going to um, go to this website real fast. So um, let's see if I can, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I am going to go to this website. so that you can actually see what they do there. And then I'm gonna start sharing again. Thank you for your patience. Can you all see this? I hope so. So this is Red Rover. And so we, we last in January, before the Rona, we were able to hold a one day um, pet summit with them and they came and they did a training all day. Um, it was great. It was held at Sojourner Center 
and they um, they basically talked about what they did along with Greater Good, which is a construction company. And so they worked with the Red Rover to help build construction. They do, they've done a lot of stuff. They helped to um, uh, redo the cat sanctuary at, I know, cat sanctuary at Sojourner Center recently um, within the last year or so. And it's really cool if you ever get a chance to go take a tour, it's really awesome, which I highly recommend doing. But Red Rover has different grants um, that they provide. And so these are their grants. So emergency boarding grants, urgent care grants, domestic violence safe escape grants, um, and then domestic violence, domestic violence housing grants. And so this is the one that I wanted to show. Um, so you can go in here, you can watch the webinar. It, basically what happens is, and so this is to get funding for, um, for on-site safe housing. And so this is the safety. So Red Rover partners with the Sheltering Animals and, Sa and Families Together Safety Program that I talked about earlier. Initiative to create more pet friendly emergency shelter options for survivors of domestic violence. Our safe housing onsite grants enable domestic violence shelters to create space for pets to live on site. Um, and so you just basically need to do two things. Um, you basically just need to partner with a, um, with a veterinary service or a veterinarian's office and partner with a pet rescue because Red Rover feels, um, and, and as do we, feels that it's really important to have these things um, to not be siloed and to be able to work together. We can't do this work without having conversations with veterinarians. We need their help. We need to be able to check animals out when they come into shelter and make sure they're okay. We need spay and neuter services, um, all of those things. So um, it's really important that we have that. And so those are their two grant requirements to get this. And, it, and it's up to $25,000. Um, and they're, they may have changed the grants um, application um, reporting times, but usually it's in May. They do two, they have two, one's in May and one's in October. So there is one coming up if that's something that you wanna look into. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint. Does anyone have any questions on that at all? Um, and then PetSmart Charities is another great resource. And so you can go into, again, I put all of the stuff in here. You can go into the, to their, to their organization's information and you can, um, ah, I didn't share my screen. You can go into all of their information and you can see all that. Why is this doing this to me? You know what I'm saying? I tried to be, I tried to be fancy for you all and it just didn't work out. I apologize, but you can go into PetSmart Charities and you can look around all their stuff and what they're doing in their grants. And then the PAUSE Act, which is great. So this, um, this was passed in 2018, part of the farm bill. And it basically gave, um, uh, money is coming from OVC and $2 million in grants. And so that's 400,000 to five organizations. I don't think that it's been announced yet who the five organizations are because the grant was just submitted a few months ago. And so we're still waiting to hear back um, on who's gonna get that money um, and, uh, and what they're gonna do with it. So I'm very excited about that. And then having capital campaigns. So a capital campaign is an intensive fundraising effort designed to raise a specific sum of money within a defined period of time to meet the varied asset building needs of an organization. These needs can include the construction of new buildings, the renovation or enlargement of existing buildings, purchase or improvement of land, acquisition, furnishing, furnishings, oh my gosh, we've gone over and all can be placed in a developing goal for capital fundraising. And so, and then one more thing that I did not put on here that just recently happened was that the NCADV, the National um, Coalition Against Domestic Violence, they, um, they just partnered with Purina. So that's a really great way of looking at it. So sustainability, community events and support, partnerships with other programs, veterinarians, pet rescues, 
VOCA may be something that we might look into later. So we have, we were asked, you know, this year, everyone submitted for discretionary funds. And um, what does that mean? And can we use that for pets? I don't know. So that, so when discretionary funding comes up again, that might be something that we look into as well. Ah, and then the Pur Purina Purple Leash Project, which you can go into that website. And again, they did, they have a whole, um, Yes, my address is at the end of this, Jennifer. Thank you. So she asked if I could add my address, um, my email address. And so that is on there. And so I will get to that. I apologize that we're running over. I just have so much stuff to tell you. But if you just give me just a couple more minutes, I will finish. So again, I wanted you to, I was hoping that we would have time to have a conversation about who in our community can we partner with? Are there restaurants and bars and, 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 and organizations that we can we partner with to talk about this, to bring more awareness and to help build fundraising in our communities? And then from another person in our share committee, my dog was the only sense of comfort and unconditional love that I had for a long time. I was afraid that without me, something horrible would happen to him and there would be no one to take care of him, to take him outside, to feed him, or just to keep him alive. So that's, that's just something for us to keep in mind as we continue doing this work. So some things we can do now, we talked about safety planning, want to develop relationships with animal care agencies, in-service training with other agencies, reciprocate by training them about our work in the community. What do we do? What do, do you know, pet rescues that we want to partner with, let's talk to them and see what, see, let them know what we do in our community. Support legislation um, when legislation comes up and you, we can talk about, you know, those things. We have a policy person here at the coalition that works on legislation. If you have any ideas on how we can support our pets and our survivors, you can let me know and I will get that to her. Work with animal shelters and veterinarians and then add pet questions on our helpline and hotline. Again, from another survivor, I stayed many years for them, always trying to keep them safe from violence and not ever wanting to lose them. They were my safety haven and net, safety haven and net to be strong enough to survive and plan a way out for all of us. Like just beautiful. And it's just so important that we have the resources for our survivors. And last but not least, I wanna talk about the BARC program, which is why we're able to have these um, conversations right now. Um, Yes, and then rest, and then thank you, Jenna. She put in rescue rebuild at greatergood.org, and I have that at the end of this as well. Jenna, thank you so much. Please go and take a look at rescue rebuild. They're such a great organization, and we love having conversations with them. So our bark, our bark, our our bark project of Aces DV. So we wanted to remove barriers to safety and services for sexual and domestic violence survivors. So we do education and training and technical assistance. That's my job, that's what I do. But on a big broader scale, we, we, have, um, we have a fund here at, at the coalition that helps folks with pet rental deposits, transportation of pets, veterinary fees and pet boarding and any other things that you can think of. When we were, um, when I was talking earlier about the the kennels and that, that we had a, a program here in Arizona ask for for um, resources for kennels for so their for their for, for their foster care program. We were able to provide the money for the for those kennels and so that they can have um, more capacity for their survivors. And so please keep us as a resource. We want to be. This is such a unique fund that we have here. Um, specifically, it's not just for survivors trying to flee. It's for survivors specifically with pets that need safety. Um, and so we are so pleased and, and excited to be able to do this for our survivors in our community. Here's some resources that I put up here with all the links. And so um, please take a look at that if you're interested. And again, if you want this, um, you can send it to me. These are all the safety programs here in Arizona so that you can start having conversations with other people doing this work here in Arizona. What are they doing? How are they doing it? What is going on? How were they funded? Um, what partnerships do they have? This is great. And I just thought it was really important for us to have all this information. And then here's me, here's our domestic violence response team. Um, I'm in the middle, my name is Samantha. 
I really appreciate you guys taking the time. I'm so sorry I went over today. That's never happened before. Um, but I am going to, um, if you can take a moment and um, I am going to put here in the chat box for those that you, the, of you that have time, um, I'm going to put in our post test. Otherwise, if you don't have time, I'll be sending it to you all um, through email tomorrow along with the survey. And if you could please fill out the survey and the post test, it would be so incredible and amazing for our funders and for me just to know like what I need to work on. Obviously, I need to work on my timing this time. Um, but other than that, like what can be made better? What suggestions do you have? Um, I definitely want to make sure that we are such a good resource here in Arizona for all of you to continue doing this work that I want to make sure that um, I'm getting you the, you know, what you need. And so please fill out the survey. I would so appreciate it. Um, and then here's our post test that I'm putting in right now before you all get going. And does anyone have any questions or comments, concerns? Thank you so much for coming. Today was such a great day. Thank you for all of your, you know, playing with me in the beginning with your pets. And then um, Jenna, thank you so much for your resources. I so appreciate it. Um, really important. So glad you've been on these, on these uh, webinars. And then the last thing I'm gonna put up here for you, for those of you that have time, otherwise again, it will be sent out to you tomorrow, is the survey for today's um, uh, conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time for coming today. Thank you for those of you that were able to stay with me here um, as I went over. I so appreciate it. And then here's the survey for you. Um, both. So the first one is the post test from the pre test that you took. And the second one is the survey to tell me how good I've been doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your week. Let's see, let's, let's help these pets. And, and, and if you have any questions or you wanna talk more about building um, capacity in your program, let's talk about it. Feel free to email me. Um, email me if you want the PowerPoint. Um, here's this again so that you have it in case you missed it. Um, so that you have it so that you can email me and talk to me. Um, I love talking about this as you can see. I got so excited today. I went over our time. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I hope it was worth your time and um, you guys are incredible. And thank you for the, all the work that you all do. Kimberly, I'm so excited to have you that you're here today. I love you. Um, and I've been thinking about you. So I thank you for coming. Um, I hope that this helped a little bit. So I'm gonna stay on just for two more minutes until 11.15 in case anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, anything else we wanna talk about. Um, I appreciate all of you and the work that you do.